Have you heard of the High Elves? Hello my friends and welcome to the next installment of the Divide and Conquer version 5 of Faction Overviews. This week we are playing as the High Elves and we are getting down there. There are only 9 factions left, so 8 after the High Elves. So I've already covered over half the roster. I'd say we're like 66% of the way there through all of the factions. So there won't be too many more to go. I guess in the next couple of months, the series will be wrapping up, and then I'll probably go back to probably playing normal campaigns again. We'll see what happens in that time. So without any further ado, let us go into the High Elves. So I won't be talking really about lore or anything, just how they are in Divide and Conquer and how they play. So for your starting settlements on the east, you have Imladris, and on the far west, you have a split nation. You have Mithlond, Arland, and Forland. So your armies and factions have been merged together since version 4.5, and that is still holding true for version 5, and I think that's better. I, I am preferential towards the merged factions rather than having Imladris and Lindon be their own factions. I think it's better this way, and I think it adds a little more. Um, I'm not sure if play like replayability would be the right word because you had two factions before, but I think it just makes the campaign in general more interesting having to manage between the two nations. It reminds me of classic Third Ages implementation of the dwarves, where if you played dwarves, you had both Erebor and you had the Blue Mountains, and you were one faction, so you kind of had to work your way towards the center with both of your um, armies to basically rejoin your empire, and it was cool because you made this, like, anvil shape as you went down the Misty Mountains and connected the Northern Mountain Ranges. But anyway, that is besides the point. That is a topic for another video. So, we've gone over the starting settlements. We'll talk about your lords. So, the High Elves are very unique in that they are the only faction in the game where you actually have two leaders. High Lord Círdan in the west and High Lord Elrond in the east over at Imladra. So, should one die, I believe you go down to only one uh, lord at that point. I don't remember if both can retain the status of dual High Lord. I could be mistaken. I... Admittedly, I haven't really played any High Elf campaign since, like, version 4.6. I maybe played a little bit, but I never got that far. They were never really my go-to faction. I always liked the Woodland realm a lot more than the High Elves. But those are your two faction leaders, so we'll just go from the top down. High Lord Círdan in Mythlond. He has a great bodyguard. He has the Mythlond Nobles. Very expensive upkeep. You might want to keep him in the city at 850 does have a biography, tons of hit points there. Eight from that alone, House of Círdan. A little bit of lore here you can get just by reading these different uh, trait boxes. There's also Lord of uh, Mithlon, of course. Has uh, Erastor as his counselor. The Sword Iglos, Narya, the uh, Ring of Fire. And he's the commander of your troops. So he's great to have. His starting army has Lindar Bowman and Lindar Guards garrisoned in Mithlond. For Elrond, he comes with his own unique strategy map model and uh, bodyguard. The Gilgalad's Company, a very, very powerful um, bodyguard. Free upkeep, so you can just keep him garrisoned or use him on the field. You don't have to pay for his soldiers. 20, mi 20 melee attack, 11 missile, 34 defense, mostly armor, but a little bit less in the defensive skill there, but still quite high. They are relentless, so they do not have any stagger animations or defensive animations. They will just cut through any enemy they fight like it's basically a hot knife through butter. These guys are absolute blenders, only really held back by their lower battalion count at only like 40 soldiers here. Of course, if you can get some personal security, retinues, and traits, you can increase that, I believe. I could be mistaken there. That might be the cap on the unit itself. Other starting generals, you have Gildor Inglorian, and he starts in the center. He was out visiting the hobbits over here in the Shire, and Gildor just comes with a unit of Lindar guards. Standard bodyguard for him, um, does have a special ability, the Light of Elberth, and I didn't go over the special abilities of our other generals, but I'll go back to that in a second. The point of Gildor being in the center here is that you can either send him east to help out with Amladris or send him west to help out with Lindon there. So he's approximately more or less in the middle here. Um, 
I'd honestly rather see him put on the Bree roads, because you can move really fast through Bree territory, and I feel like him just being down by this river slows things down unnecessarily, so I would recommend just maybe having the team replace him somewhere up here on the Bree road. That might make a little more sense for getting him back to the homelands, but anyway, send Guildhor where you want. The special ability for Kirdan. He also has Power of the Eldar, one-time use, uh, just a very fantastic ability. Fatigue reduction, combat effectiveness boost, and locks your own morale. Of course, if you have Kirdan leading an army, like your elves are going to fight to the death, so that's not really going to see much use there. And for Highlord Elrond, I believe he also has Light of Elbereth. Why can I not scroll down? There we go. Oh, Power of the Eldar also. So, yeah, same ability there as Kirdan, so very... Powerful. I didn't go over Elrond's um, retinues and stuff. He does have the, I'm going to mispronounce this, the Ororan Noldoron. He is the Lord of Imladris, Guardian of Elven Wisdom, has Hadhafeng, and Vilya, the Ring of Air. So I'm probably going to mispronounce some of these titles and ancillaries, but that is it for your starting generals. You might be wondering, where are the twins? If you don't know, you will unlock the twins at turn 15. Under the condition that you send a diplomat to Oast Soul. Basically, the first four years or so of the campaign, the twins are sent away. And in your beginning message text, it explains that what's going on. Your other general you will unlock after taking 15 regions. Or not taking 15 regions, but controlling 15. So you start with four. So you just need to take 11 more. And you will unlock Glorfindel. And in the little divide and conquer lore blurb, Glorfindel is actually sent all the way past Rovanian into the lands of Rune and Mordor. So Glorfindel is doing a bit of scouting over in the east at the turn at the game start. But once you build enough settlements, he shall return to you. And that is how you unlock them. So for other sorts of scripts that you have, your barrack system is very unique for the High Elves. I mean, I guess a lot of factions have their own unique system. But anyway, I'll talk about that. The Teleri barracks is only available in regions that are bordering some sort of water feature so anything with like a river like a major river so this one i believe does count here this is the uh part of the guathlo river at least upstream of it before it becomes the big one down here um or if you are in coastal settlement you can get the teleri barracks and for any mountains or grasslands you shall have the capability to recruit or not recruit but construct the noldor barracks so that's what you have here, Noldor, Noldor, I'm going to be stumbling on my pronunciation here today, guys, I'm sorry about that. The Noldor Guard Hall will give you a Manyar Riders, a Manyar Swordmasters, and a Manyar Rangers. And then the second upgrade of that, I actually don't think I can see, here it is. The second upgrade of that does unlock the Noldor Defenders and the Noldor Veterans and Archers. The Elder Renway units are also unlocked through this building, though they are only available in Imladris or down in Ostinathil, down in the southwest. To actually unlock construction of the Noldor Guard Hall, you must take Ostinathil and rebuild the, correct me if I'm wrong in my pronunciation, the Gwaithi Myrdain. And if you reconstruct that, which does require a Hall of Music, Master Builder's Hall, and the Tier 3 Blacksmith, as well as the settlement being upgraded, then you can build the that Gwaithi Myrdain. It will unlock the Noldor Barracks for all of your... Um, all of your regions, and then, well, at least the ones that are mountainous or grassland, and you'll also unlock Dorna Norsten, who is, he used to be like a cavalry bodyguard in the olden days of Divide and Conquer. He was a fan favorite, I think, but now he is a smith of a Regian general, so you'll unlock him uh, as a general once you've rebuilt that. And in fact, you might just need to control Ostinathiel to unlock the Noldor Barracks. I could be mistaken on that. It's, it's one or the other. Either way, you're going to want this settlement, so... We'll talk about nearby rebel expansion and I guess what I might recommend in the early game. Let's start on the western end. I find that's a little bit easier and I do have to thank uh, Praise, not VL or Volt Prixies as I have mispronounced before, but Praise for sending me basically a list of features and some recommendations about the High Elves. Thank you so much for that man, that helps because I haven't played the High Elves a lot. So. In the West, it is highly recommended just to sweep up the nearby rebel settlements of Perth and Loon, which can make quite a decent amount of money in the early game. Not crazy amounts, but it does easily make a thousand gold as a village once you've started building the uh, different infrastructure there. Uh, in the East, you'll want to have Under Towers. This gives you a Palantir. 
which is a very nice bonus for the elves. I can't quite remember what the Palantir gives you as the elves. It might just be an income bonus or it might be a melee, melee weapon bonus. I can't quite recall what they get from it, but it is something nice. And even Buzzra Doom to the south is this is a mountainous settlement, has great mines. There is an argument to be made. I might suggest even trading Buzzra Doom to the Dwarves of Erdluin so that they may build the vaults there. And if you want to come back and have those riches for yourselves, you could either betray them, though most likely they might just betray you as they, in my experience, they appear to take the rings most of the time. I, have, I haven't really seen Ered Lewin reject the rings um, that often. I, it feels like it's 25% of the time they'll reject the rings, 50% of the time, or 75% of the time they'll actually accept the gift and go to war with everyone. But that is anecdotal, and I believe in the scripting it is supposed to just be like a coin flip, a 50-50. Um, I could be mistaken, it might be based on your faction, but I'm pretty sure it's a 50-50 choice. So, there is an argument to be made to give the Dwarves of Ered Luin, Buzzer Doom, allow them to build up the vaults, and then sweep in to take those riches for your own self later on. Or you can just simply hold on to the mountainous settlement. Farther expansion from that, you can go southeast into Dol Vorn, Kor Willishar, Karis Nernaled, and fight the men of Enidwyth as most likely. You may be going into war with the fisher folk and the barbarous barbarians down here. They're so backwards compared to the High Elven society that they can just easily be crushed, but be wary of their javelins. Those are quite deadly. Outside of that, you are probably unlikely to go to war against Bree unless you are playing like a total war campaign. So you have allies over there, you have allies in the Dunedain, and at the beginning you are neutral with Ered Luin, so I would recommend maybe just getting an alliance with them so you don't have to worry about the dwarves attacking you um, in the early game, though they shouldn't be much of a threat if you do need to fight them up here. And Thorin's Hall, who's in our Fahamgothel, these can be some very wealthy settlements. So the West is arguably the easier end and probably the one that you want to expand from as your breadbasket and economic base. In the East, in Amladris, you're a bit more constrained on your options. Your only real rebel territory is Kamath Bryn. Though be wary, there are a few troll generals, um, or captains, I guess, hanging around here. Captain Nakoth should have two units of trolls. There's another one hiding somewhere in this forest that may be supplemented with other goblins, and I think there's a third unit on the northeastern side of the forest. There's at least... There's at least two that I know for sure, and there might be a third Rebel General. So be careful going into the Rudauer Uplands. You probably want to build up a strong force before you go up here. And typically, I see that these Rebel Generals like to go just sit in Kamath Bryn. So that makes it a little bit easier to deal here. Beyond that, you are surrounded by goblins on all other sides and the Northern Dunedain to your southwest at Fenish Druinen. So like the early expansion, will be going to Zagkala to take the first mountain hold. And then south to Brunost, making your way downtown, and on Enerod, and then finally Ost and Ethel. And Ost and Ethel is the one that you're really going to want to take. So focus on maybe military on the east end and ec economy on the west. Because if I'm not mistaken, Mithlond is your actual capital at the start. Uh, because that's where most of your money is going to be coming from. Imladris actually suffers a decent amount from corruption here. I actually have Elrond out right now, so putting him back in. Negates most of that, but even a great general such as Elrond, you're still suffering some income bonuses, or not bonuses, but debuffs due to corruption. So you will need to probably get like a hall of music going on here and some other law buildings. Didn't talk about this, but you also have two other starting units, Dunedain Wardens, Captain Edron and Captain Edenost. I recommend, and this is something I saw in, uh, is it Lige, Lige's or Lizage? I forget his, I forget his, how to actually say his name. I think it's Lige's D or something like that. Um, he also does Divide and Conquer playthroughs, and I was actually watching his first High Elf, uh, where it's part one of his High Elf campaign, I enjoyed it. Um, but he got besieged by Captain Istrak here at the end of turn two, but he had withdrawn his two Dunedin Wardens to Imladris, so I would recommend that seemed to be a great way to handle this first army. Garrison these guys in Imladris, Captain Istrak will besiege you on turn two, and then at the end of turn three, he should attack you. And it's a very easy settlement to defend, and Ladris is great. You have a gatehouse, and then in front of the gatehouse, you actually have walls that wrap around, kind of like the shape, like a like an L shape. And they're surrounded by water, so you're protected, but you can have your archers far forward and shooting into the back of would-be assaulters. So it's actually a very nice place 
um, to defend. So I recommend doing that with Captain Isthrak's army and then starting to push into Zogkala right after since they won't have too much going on there. Um, outside of that, Goblin Town is great for making money. And then if you can get into Khazad Doom, that will also help you a lot with your economy. You'll luck out if the goblins kick the dwarves out of Khazad Doom East. You're going to have a very, very wealthy power base over here. And that would might be the most ideal situation. As for other enemies you are likely to fight, from the north will be Angmar and potentially in the south, the men of Dunland. I believe for your victory conditions, you do just need to beat Mordor and the Dominion of Isengard. And you only need to hold 10 regions, with the only one you're not holding being Baradur. So, you really don't need to play this campaign super expansionist. Really just taking out these settlements here, having a power base set in Imladris, and then taking nearby settlements around Mithlond for a breadbasket, and you're good to go. Just send the Noldor armies out to Mortar at that point, destroy the ring, destroy Isengard on your way down there, and you have won the campaign. So we'll talk about buildings and infrastructure. Well, you are high elves. You have no restrictions. Your smiths go to tier 5 in most of your cities, but in the Gwaithi Meridain, uh, in Ostanethil, you can get tier 6, which is the... Uh, what is it called? Not Noldoran Plate. There's one higher. Uh, Celebrimborian Plate. That's the name of the armor upgrade. So, And you don't even need to fully build out the armor tiers to unlock that. You just need the blacksmith, and then you can build the Gwaith E. Myrdain. And then there's really no purpose to constructing the armor or the Noldoran armor, unless you really just value the 25 gold here and then the extra 15 you get from doing that. There's not really a purpose to doing that. Only in Ostenet build, though. As for your other buildings, of course, the Teleri Barracks and the Noldor Barracks just require a Hall of Song and then a Hall of Culture to build. From the Teleri Tier 1, you get Lindar Guards and Bowmen. From Tier 2, you get the Guards, Bowmen, Sindar Spearmen, Sindar Archers, and Sindar Axemen. I'm not saying the Long Spears. Were the Long Spears removed? They shouldn't be. They were in his campaign. They might just be over in the in the western side here. Yeah, okay, because they're Linden Long Spears. They're not Lindar. They're Lindon. So they're only in the western regions to get these but they're pretty solid pike elves so that's i mean they'd be pretty powerful if you could get them everywhere uh, other buildings for your noldor barracks i think i went over this earlier where are they right here you can get the uh, man York units the rider swordmasters and rangers and then the noldor archers defenders and the veterans outside of that you have pretty much unrestricted construction standard market series farming and all that I will load a quick save here where I have the Gwaith the Emir Dane and show you the other, the rest of the unlocks that you'll get from that. And here we are with a save where I have Ost in Ethil, and I can show you guys Dorn and Norsten over here. Dorn and Norsten is quite the powerful general. No special uh, battle map model for him. It would be cool if he had like a hammer instead. That would be kind of cool. Um, does have a biography giving him four hit points. House of Finarfin does have the Light of Elberth and some great. Uh, smithing ancillaries, a helmet of a Regian for another two hit points, and the Noldor shield for another one. Of course, being a smith, he comes with the, excuse me, the Regian smiths. Arguably one of the strongest, if not the strongest, infantry unit in the game, bar Sauron, and I can't think of anyone else that would come to mind to be this powerful, because Balin's Guard isn't this strong. Yeah, I'd have to go with the Regian smiths as the strongest infantry unit outside of Sauron's bodyguard themselves. They would probably beat the Eregian Smiths if I had to take a stab at it. But he is quite powerful, and having the Gwaith E. Myrdain, where is it? This will give you the increase in tradable goods and the Eregian Smiths. Do note the Tier 1 version of it, if I can check on here. Oh, it actually won't show me because I have it unlocked. Um, anyway, the Tier 1 version of the Gwaith E. Myrdain does give you a building cost reduction and a 2.5% population growth bonus just to help you get the city back to where it was. Basically showing that the ruins are influencing the like the high elves to return to this area and re-establish it. Though it, those bonuses are lost, the building cost reduction and the population growth are lost when you upgrade it to the Gwaithi Myrdanus. These are very expensive smiths and they want their money for it. So no more free labor from the High Elves for that. And of course, taking that will unlock the extra units in the Noldor Barracks, being the Eldar Rinway Tyrion, though, and the Eldar Rinway Roquen, as I believe you would say that. I 
Roquin sounds right to me. If I'm wrong, you guys just post it down in the comments below. You guys are always... I know a lot of you guys are a bit more well-versed in Tolkien pronunciations and in general lore than I am. I'm a big fan, but I am not, like, perfect by any means there. So that's really it for the campaign map side of the high elf, so I'll now take it over to the battle map. And welcome to the beautiful map of Under Towers, which you don't often see much in a campaign. There's that one rebel guy that hangs out there. Just some rebel corsair general led by a whole army of, or leading a whole army of Anid Wythe, Kifi Huntsmen, Sauerline mercenaries, that sort of thing. But you never really fight the battle map outside of that, and I figured it was fitting for Imladris' overview. I guess High Elves, Imladris, Linden, same thing here. So, going on with the General's Bodyguard first, these are the Calaquendi Lords. So your generic bodyguard you'll have for any other generals that aren't your... Gosh, is everything you have scripted unique? Yeah, every general you have at the beginning of the game is unique, including the four generals that come in as scripts. So, you really only get Calaquendi Lords if you make adoptions, a, a, uh, a new general is born, like a child grows up and becomes a general or you recruit one in your capital. So you won't often see too many regular Calaquendi Lords in your campaign as you have so many unique generals. But here they are, 37 men strong, or I guess I should say 37 elves strong, 15 attack, 7 charge, and 33 defense. So great stats, really powerful for a bodyguard unit, though at a very low battalion size. They have locked morale, so they will fight to the death a higher movement speed as all elves do, and in general, they are just solid sword and board elven units. Not too much I can really say about these guys, or general will most likely stay alive for a very long time with these as his bodyguard. So now we go into what I dub the tier 1 elven infantry, though for any other faction, this is like starting off at tier 2, to even some, it might even be tier 3 if you are talking about orcs. So we'll start with the Lindon Long Spears first. These guys are only available in the Lindon region. Four attack, five charge pikemen with nine defense, six of that being armor and three of that being defense skill. These guys are quite capable at holding a line. If you keep them in guard mode, they will keep the enemy at bay and in position at a reasonable distance where your archers can basically make, oh, excuse me, can basically safely shoot into the enemy though they themselves won't get too many kills as they are just keeping their sticks and keeping the enemy at bay. Of course, any pikemen don't have them on guard mode if you want them to actually start killing things and moving forward in their line. So, Linden Longspears, a great unit to have, uh, honestly, assaulting a settlement, defending a flank, anything like that, good against cavalry. Just a solid, solid elven unit, though by stats, arguably your weakest, but they are pikes, so they more than make up for that. Next up are the Lindar Guards. These guys have a mixed uh, arsenal, some with axes and some with the elven swords here. Lindar Guards, 8 attack, 6 charge, and 15 defense. This is like almost Gondor infantry level in terms of unit quality. This is very, very solid for what is basically your militia unit. 110% movement speed as most elves, in fact all elves, move very fast. So you can actually chase down enemies with your infantry which is very nice. The Lindar Guards are just a solid front-line unit, flanking force, whatever you need them to be. They are just a good sword and board unit. Um, arguably, of course, your squishiest of all of your Elven units, except for maybe the Elven um, Archers and the Linden Longspears, but overall, they are very good combatants. I guess, basically, they're like Erebor Infantry. They're on that level, um, but with greater movement speed, and I think maybe even slightly higher defense, because they do have very good defensive skills. So, next to them, I have put... Oh, sorry, that's, those are the archers, so we'll go into the tier 2 of the elves. So, we'll start from the left here, the Amanyar Swordmasters, with this gorgeous new model that was added in 4.6. Admittedly, I kind of miss the old Tolkis Faithful, which was what this unit used to be, because they had armor piercing. They were meant just to be like absolutely jacked buff elves that were just really powerful and had these great swords, but now they are just simple sword masters with very good stats. 16 attack, 17 defense. This is like a cell sword quality unit, more or less, and they also frighten nearby enemy infantry, so they retain the effect the original Tolkis had where they made it, people scared of them. They just lost the armor piercing in the transition. Very good morale, good response there, and high movement speed. They're going to be excellent at flanking. 
And do notice they have a bonus against various beasts, the camels, wargs, and elephants. Just don't let them get charged, allow them to counter charge or have the long spears support them so that they don't just get run down by these giant mounts. But they will do very well with their high charge bonus. Really just send them against anything, they are going to do a lot of work to it. I'd say you're not going to fight camels or elephants in a high elven campaign, but you will fight a decent number of wargs, that is for sure, given that pretty much all of your enemies have wargs that you're going to be fighting. Angmar, Isengard, the Orcs of the Misty Mountains. The only real exception is Mordor, and they get other cavalry anyway, but you don't have a bonus against normal horses, so keep that in mind with the Manyar Swordmasters. Next to them, the Sindar Axemen. These guys have armor piercing as well, even though they're Axemen, something that I am actually a big fan of. I like it when axemen have armor piercing. They were starting to get taken away and then the axes became maces for a lot of units. And I, I kind of preferred the axes, especially like heavy hand axes. Cinder axemen, 10 attack, 21 total defense. Um, good at hiding in woods, all that very good morale response. A little bit slower at 105% movement speed because they are wearing heavy armor. But overall, just a solid unit, that 21 defense. Like these guys, they're really just Gondor infantry with, I believe, one more base attack and then armor piercing. Though they do have less elves in the battalion, only 114. But you gotta love how high quality their models look. Every time I look at factions like the High Elves or, like, the new Dale stuff I've been seeing or, like, Dunland, it just makes me think of, like, how badly Rohan is aged. And it's... Oh, uh, that's a topic for another video when we get to Rohan. But it, you really start to see that some factions fall behind when we have quality like this... Next to them are the Sindar Spearmen, the Spear and Shield equivalent. Notably, actually have higher attack than the Axemen, but they don't have the armor piercing, so that's what balances that out. Six charge is solid, 24 defense, and they have the Shield Wall, which I really love. And I think Shield Wall looks very good with the Elves here. Not too much more I can really say. They Similar functionality, these are just Spearmen, good against cavalry. We all know how to use Spearmen. So in the back now, we'll get into this interesting Noldor units. First of all, the Noldor veterans. Simply an upgrade to the Emanyar Swordmasters. Locked morale, 105% movement speed. No bonus against the camels or anything like that. But that 18 attack, 9 charge is very, very powerful. And that 25 defense. They are very tough to kill in melee. Their only real weakness would be something like crossbows, so keep that in mind if you fight Isengard or Dunlin with these guys. They can be weak to those and armor-piercing javelins. So if you do fight and White, then just be wary of the javelins. They will still claim many lives of these elves, as they only can rely on their 16 armor. And armor-piercing missiles will get through that, and these will fall in battle. But get them engaged in melee combat and their curved swords. You see those high elves from... Uh, Himladris, they've got curved swords. Uh, they are very, very powerful. Uh, next to them, we'll go into the Noldor Defenders before I talk about the Elder Renway Tyrno. Noldor, Noldor Defenders, literally just the upgrade to the Sindar Spearmen. Of course, only available in the Noldor Barracks. 14 attack is amazing for a spear unit with 7 defense. Or, sorry, 7 charge and 31 defense. 6 of that being shield, 10 defense skill, and 15 armor. So, Still primarily relying on their armor to keep them alive, but with a very high defense skill and high shield to compensate that. These guys are phenomenal. Um, not really going to die against anything anytime soon. They're only real... I don't think you really probably have to worry about with these guys would be... Like, obviously, Mumakil. If you fight Mumakil or Great Beast, they're going to kill a few of the, uh, these elves. But the elves will take down those in combat. Uh, Nazik High and Runic Nafta Bombs, those will absolutely destroy these guys, but like anything else in infantry, even armor-piercing specialists are going to struggle to kill the Noldor defenders if they're not, like, getting flanking charges on them. They will hold out for an incredibly long time, even though there is only 102 of them. They will just fight to the bitter end, so... A fantastic spear unit. But keep in mind, both these Noldor units are pushing over 500 upkeep per turn. I want to say these guys even go into the 600s. I could be mistaken on that. I know for sure they're at least 500 upkeep a turn to run these elves. So they are very costly in that regard. And then the other unit I threw here, the Eldar Renway Tyrano. This is your elite pike unit. Um, only available in Imladris or the um, Gwythi Mirdane. 
Uh, they inspire your nearby troops. Nine attack pikes is absolutely incredible, and 27 defense. And these pikes look extra tall, do they not? Those are very, very long spears. Um, limited only really by their very low bodyguard size at 77, which is one of the lower ends of the spectrum when it comes to infantry, but that is just a testament to their quality. Locked morale, they fight to the death, and they have a bonus against all mounts. That nine attack, they will make short work of anything that they go up against. So a very, very powerful pike unit. And then we get into the final, like, uber tier of infantry. We'll talk about the Mithlon Nobles first. An 89 strong man, or a elf. I should say elf. I'm saying man. This is elves. Uh, 20 attack. Inspire nearby troops. 38 defense. Mostly armor there. 20 armor, but with 12 defense skill. These guys are unwavering as well. They fight to the death and have 105% movement. These guys will just make short work of any enemy you're fighting. You're unlikely to go against anything that could take on Mithlon Nobles in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Your only real threat would be, like, maybe some of the elite Dwarven units. Even then, your Mithlon Nobles are going to still outclass them. I can see Dragon Slayers probably beating them in combat. Dragon Slayers are very powerful, given that they have the armor piercing and a similar stat spread. But outside of that, like, I mean, your Mithlon Nobles are going to just be absolute badass warriors. They are so, so strong. And next to them, the Oregian Smiths, your armor-piercing variant. Slightly less attack at 15 here, but more defense at 40. They have the best armor for themselves at 22. They inspire your troops. They are good at hiding in the woods. That's not even that important, really. Locked morale as well. But the fact that they have these hammers, I, I'm a big fan of proper hammer infantry, maces or whatever, but I like hammers. I like stuff like this, and I wish we had more hammer units in the game. I guess the Iron Fists are there, but... I like hand hammers. I think these are cool. The Regian Smiths, just an incredibly, incredibly powerful unit. Send them in battle against anything that is heavily armored. So Isengard Infantry, maybe. Uh, Guardians of Karn Doom. Uh, what else is like incredibly heavily armored? Uh, dwarves, if you're going to fight the Dwarves, bring in the Regian Smiths. They will make short work of anything. That armor piercing is so, so incredibly powerful. They are an amazing unit. Definitely very expensive, but very nice to field. That does it for the infantry contingent, so now we'll talk about the archers, starting with the Lindar Bowmen. These are your militia archers, though at militia level they are coming in with 6 melee, 5 missile attack, only a 4 charge, but with 12 defense, half of that being their armor. Uh, good morale, 20 missiles and 170 meter range with average accuracy. Though do note, average accuracy for an elf is greater than average accuracy for a human or a dwarf, which is greater than average accuracy for an orc. So their average is more like probably a human archer's high um, on this description rating here. So they are very, very solid archers. In the early game, it's recommended to get as many of the Lindar Bowmen as you can, since you really can't afford to take too many casualties if you want to keep expanding, and having the Lindar Bowmen helps to alleviate the damage you might take from your enemies. If you can just shoot the entire enemy army dead before going into combat, that will save the lives of your troops. Next to them are the Lindar Mariners, one of your very few, and your last armor-piercing unit that I have to show here. Of course, only armor-piercing with their missile attack. The Lindar Mariners, uh, effective against armor with the Javelin, 10 melee, 8 missile attack, 8 charge is very nice, and 14 defense. They have 3 Javelins at high accuracy, so they are very deadly and very precise with those Javelins. And afterwards, they come in with very aggressive stats here, especially with the charge. So ideally with these guys, you would either skirmish or you would get them around your front line, like around the lines, throw the Javelins into the backs of enemies, and then charge in, and I believe they have dual swords. Yeah, they have dual swords. Some of them even have two axes or one axe and a sword, so they've got a cool load out there. Um, just be wary that since they have your highest missile attack outside of one of the units we'll get to later, they are most likely going to be shot by any AI missile units that sees them on the battlefield. So that is one issue with using high attack javelins, is that they are most likely going to get shot to death. But they have armor at least to help them stay alive. Next are the Sindar Archers, your tier 2. 10 melee attack, 7 missile, and 16 defense there. 26 missiles at 190 meter range and high accuracy. Just an overall very good archer. 
Uh, when it comes to missile defense, they are only at 11 with their armor and lower defensive skill than other dedicated melee units, but they are great at their skirmishing role. Just try to use all of their ammo before you have to send them into combat, and they will just get so many kills with those arrows. It's, it's crazy the damage that your elven archers can get throughout a battle, and they just look amazing. I love the Sindar. They just look so freaking cool. That dark blue and the silver and these gradients on the helmets, I love it. Next to them and behind, I guess, the Noldor Archers, an even more powerful archer unit. 11 melee attack, 9 missile attack, so they will get targeted by enemy archers if they're in range versus the um, Lindar Mariner, since they have the higher missile attack there. Um, they have very high accuracy, 32 missiles and 210 meter range. If you get, like, a couple of these guys in the back lines of your army, you can just safely take down any missile threats or any other high value targets that you need to shoot long before they'll ever get to your uh, front line and an amazing thing is with the elves is because of your higher movement speed you can shoot and then fall back and continue to shoot and skirmish that way up against pretty much any force that doesn't have cavalry and expend most of your ammo that way doing safe skirmishes before engaging in melee since they have such high range you won't even need to worry about counter fire coming their way it is quite quite powerful and then the final missile unit i just threw them here though they're arguably an even better melee unit than they are at shooting gil galad's company relentless 34 defense 11 missile attack 19 melee attack 9 charge uh they i thought they had a shield do they not have a shield value to these huh i could have sworn the uh gil galad's company no they have two-handed swords that's right they don't have shields they have uh, like two-handed swords uh they are very very powerful now at range they're not going to be too powerful as you only have 33 models but they are one of the few units that has the exceptional accuracy tag the highest order of accuracy you can find and they have the highest range of any archer unit in the game which is a change that i actually made because there was a suggestion a long time ago that gilgalad's company shouldn't be outranged by doing an bodyguard so i gave them the extra range to make them the best so that is like artillery level range with these guys 38 missiles they're not going to do as much damage per se as like noldor archers will just as a factor of less elves in the uh, battalion but their incredible accuracy and incredibly high missile damage will mean that they get a good amount of kills before you need to even send them into melee combat if you decide to do so and if you do they are no pushovers they are very very powerful I wonder, they probably wouldn't beat a Raging Smiths in melee, and that's more of a factor of the model count size. But if you let them shoot the Raging Smiths long enough and even had equal numbers of men in melee, they might actually win that combat. It'd be interesting to see how that matchup goes. They also fight nearby enemy, uh, so if you're playing um, against the goblins and take out their general and you have Elrond in your army, send him around close to the goblins and they are going to flee in terror. It is quite, quite beautiful. And it doesn't say, like, Fright Nearby Enemy Infantry, it just says Fright Nearby Enemy. So that includes cavalry and anything else they will cause a fear effect to, which is very, very nice. So I'd, I'd argue maybe more so of an infantry unit, or I guess a hybrid unit, but I threw them in the archers here because they do have a bow. Now we'll go into the cavalry, and we're almost done with the units. First of all, the Amanyar Riders, these are your early tier uh, Lancer Cavalry, 7 attack, 9 charge, and 16 defense, so very solid. These are like upper tier Rohan Cavalry almost, not quite like Royal Guard Rohan, but more like A-Red Lancer tier, more or less. This is very powerful, and this is your entry level Cavalry unit. Uh, one thing I will say is, do not, I haven't included the Dunedain Wardens or the Dunedain Scouts in this overview. I mean, those are more of a Dunedain unit, but you do get a couple of those in Imladris, but we're just not going to talk about them for the faction overview so we're only have three cavalry units here 110 percent movement speed so very very powerful on these Amanyar riders next to them the Amanyar rangers these are your elven horse archers in that loose horse archer formation they do have cantabrian circle eight missile six melee attack and 14 defense with six charge so not as good at the uh melee components but once they do run out of ammo have them just chase down routing units or rear charge they'll do well enough there just keep them away from spears and the Emanuel Rangers will do very nice. They have a very high accuracy, 30 missiles, and they have a bonus versus both horses and wargs, though they don't have a bonus against camels. So uh, if you go against camels, they aren't going to be as effective, but uh, you probably won't ever fight Harad as the high elves unless you really... 
go late into a campaign or to like a migration campaign or something like that. A many are rangers though, these are a great horse archer and during your campaign, having them and the Duna 9 scouts to do early skirmishing is very, very effective. Our last cavalry unit and one of the most cavalry, most powerful cavalry units in the entire game, the Eldar Renway Roquen. 12 attack, 12 charge, 30 defense, and a 10 secondary attack with locked morale. These guys are incredibly, incredibly strong, mostly relying on their armor. They are swift. They will do tons of damage. They will clear out entire units on their own. I believe I believe Glorfindel actually has a unit of these as his bodyguard, if I'm not mistaken. And it just makes him able to solo like entire armies. It is crazy how powerful this unit is. So that is it for the roster. So mostly your only real weakness is the fact that you have limited armor piercing. Your only armor piercing comes from three units, the Sindar Axemen, which are a late game unit, the Regent Smiths, which are only in um in Ostenethil, and the Lindar Mariners, which you can only get at coastal settlements. So you don't have much for armor piercing, but outside of that, your roster really doesn't have any weakness. You definitely cover all bases very well. So I am now actually going to somewhat deploy an army here to attack the our enemy here. And normally I don't even do this. Normally I just let the AI do what it wants to do and I just don't care. But this time I think I will do a proper battle up against our enemy. I'll mostly play defensively here, but I will probably aggressively control the cavalry. So our next enemy, if you know the alphabet, you know who it is, what comes after H. It is the letter I. It is Isengard. So I brought a relatively powerful Isengard army here. Urukai Infantry, Orthanc Guard, Berserkers with the upgrades, the Armored Isengard Trolls, Urukai Pikemen, Urukai Bodyguards, and somewhere in here are the Guards of the Hand. Quite a few Guards of Orthanc. I brought them for the crossbow power, a couple of wargs, and... Even the deadly Orthanc Wardens. Now here they are, the Guards of the Hand, Saruman's Bodyguard. So I haven't done a whole lot of Isengard campaigns. I know Isengard's very, very popular. Uh, and now that they have the Orthanc Guard and Orthanc Wardens, I might actually go to play them sometime soon here. Let's go ahead and take care of these wargs early on. Now what are our archers shooting at? I guess we're shooting at those. Do I, what do I want my javelins to hit? Probably these Urukai Pikemen. And the Sindar X-Men are going to be a little bit deadly here. Let's see your can. Do we want to counter charge the trolls? I feel like we do. Bring in you guys. Oh, I brought them too close. Can we throw a javelin volley? Right into these Urukai bodyguards. Come on. Please do. Right, we get hit by our own javelins here. Our own arrow fire, which is annoying. All right, we didn't get charged by anyone over here. That's good. Charge these berserkers. Bring those guys around the flanks. Let me change the UI. This is something I've been going back to is the classic UI here. I find that's a little bit better to tell what's going on. Trolls doing a lot of damage to us. We'll bring in the Elder Renway to help support. Save these guys. Where are our elites? The Mithlon Nobles. Let's bring you guys in. Oregi and Smiths. Caliquendi Lords are probably going to die here. I might need to actually send them this way. We missed the charge on the Berserkers. That is okay. We got it off, but I missed the cinematic shot. Bring in the Elder Renway Roquen. Can we get a deadly charge on these Orthanc Wardens? They're going to try to turn their back. They're charging our horse archers. And look at that charge through heavily armored infantry. They just do not care at all. Are we doing it up against the trolls here? They're down to nine. We'll turn off the special ability there. Or the pike wall. Bring you guys around to flank. I think we just destroyed that war unit over here. Yeah, they got absolutely wrecked. Regent Smith, let's try to get you in gear. Get into a phallus formation to get around these Urkai bodyguards. Probably would be good to kill them, but I think we got them. Mithlon Nobles, let's send you up as well. Oh, we are mismicering our cavalry. Come on, get out of here, lads. If we can rear charge anything over here, we're going to do a ton of damage. Gonna hit those Orthanc Guard. Gotta stay away from those pikemen, that's for sure. Who's over here? These are the Gilgalad's company. I got Mithlon Nobles somewhere up in here. Yep, fighting the Orthanc Guard. Here comes a rear charge. Right into the back of the other Orthanc Guard. The spear and crossbow units 
Taking a lot of damage there. Continue to skirmish, lads. With everyone focusing on guards of the hand, it's just not doing much damage, though. I think it's time that we switch to those pikemen. We get our cavalry to do another rear charge here. Then our bowmen did get hit by the wargs. That's okay. Can we get an actual charge here? I think they missed up. I don't know what happened there. That was bad. Here we go. Let's charge into the wargs. Get rid of them. Origin Smiths. Let's get you guys on the Orthanc Guard as our Elder Renue Roquin destroy these warg marauders. No other defenders here. Not doing so great. The trolls actually did a lot of damage to us over here. That's okay. The trolls are very, very powerful. Keep on skirmishing, lads. We have any other reinforcements? Anyone else we can bring in here? I need to get these Origin Smiths onto those guards of the hand. The guards of the hand are shooting at someone. Probably my Noldor archers. Come on, Smiths. You are relentless. Are they relentless or am I mistaken? Hold on. Are they relentless? No, they are not. It's just the Gilgad company. Relentless would be a little bit too strong for them. I'm going to get one more charge here on these Urukai infantry before the Berserkers catch up to us. Right in the back, the heavily armored Uruks taking a lot of damage there. I should be able to win this battle, actually. I, I would think I can. Bringing these Origin Smiths. Come on, lads. Get out of there. Our general is still fighting in the front line, which is great. And we did get a charge into the Orthanc Guard. These guys should fall relatively swiftly to the power of our Reggie and Smiths. So we lost one of our units entirely. I don't know who it was. Noldor defenders still in the fight. Urukai infantry going against the Swordmasters. These trolls just did a lot to us. We have Mithlon nobles somewhere. I feel like we have Mithlon nobles somewhere. Where are they? Where are they? There you are. They're actually engaged with the Orthanc Guard here, helping out with the Berserkers. Now that we have the Eregian Smiths in combat with the Guards of the Hand. Yeah, those Guards of the Hand aren't too long for this world. If we can just get the Smiths to really just encroach on their position here. Guards of the Hand, no pushovers, but Eregians of the Smiths definitely... Did I say Eregians of the Smiths? What the heck? Eregian Smiths definitely outclass them. The general is fleeing their men now. We'll send in these Lindar guards now. Help with the Orthanc guard while our few javelins try to throw some damage over at those Urukai pikemen. Alright, our Elder Runway did get stuck in combat here up against the wardens. Come on, Lindar mariners. I need a few javelins in these, uh, right in these pikemen. Please, even though there's only like 13 of you, you can still do some damage, right? Other run away Tyrno, hit those Orthanc Wardens. These guys are just going to have to finish off the Urukai infantry. One troll remains. I bet those guys just absolutely demolished us over here. Send in the Calaquendi Lords to help out as the Tyrno help our brave Mithlon nobles out with these Orthanc Wardens. Oh, and they are routing. I think we've got this battle. This battle is definitely about to be over as the Orcs begin to flee. Archer fire going into the Urukai Pikemen, and the high accuracy of the Noldor and Gilgalad's company means I am not afraid of them doing too much friendly fire. The occasional arrow will still hit our Sindar archers, but for the most part, we're going to hit the Urukai Pikemen. And that's just something great about Elven archers. They are so accurate that you can mostly safely fire into your own forces, into the enemies by your own forces, and they will do very well. Or think Rordan's running away, Regin Smith's. Fighting those 31. And I think we know how this battle is going to end up here. Send in Gilgalad's company to help fight this battle up against the pikemen. Do we get to see them do too much in melee here? They're going to cause fear. They might even just rout these pikemen immediately. They're down to only 55. Yeah, with the archer fire coming in, with them being so low, and with Gilgalad's company causing fear, I think they're about to rout. They are shaken now. Here they go, bearing out the two-handed swords that they just kind of pulled out of their butts. And because they are relentless, they don't even care that the pikemen can attack faster than they can and keep them at range. That is something else that is very nice about relentless units. They don't care about pikemen. They will just run into combat and get into melee and start killing them in mass, which is very, very nice. Relentless is such a powerful trait to have. Okay, that is it for the battle. A few Berserkers fighting to the death. They are broken. 
and that is a high elven victory. So making up over after my last battle where I played Harad and lost horrendously to the high elves. Now I am playing the high elves and winning a horrendous battle against a, I would say, a mostly powerful Isengard force. I gave Isengard a lot of strong units there. So especially those trolls. Look at the bloodbath that happened over here. Just so many bodies. It's I love trolls. <laughs> But that will be it for today's overview, so until the next one, my friends, farewell.